I want to welcome everybody today. We have uh, quite a loaded schedule uh, in more ways than one, I think. Um, in our committee, we have uh, taken on a responsibility to try to find a way to lead Minnesota in addressing the needs of, well, more, over 100,000 of our citizens at least, and probably more. Uh, today is uh, Substance Abuse Day, uh, which is part of March's Substance Abuse Week. And um, so a lot of times a special week is kind of festive. Uh, this topic is not at all festive. It, there's a lot of hope for people, a lot of challenges. And uh, it's the duty of our committee to be the, the Senate's uh, entree into uh, trying to make it work for everybody. And um, I think as we, just if you're an observer and aren't very familiar with this, uh, and if you're part of the live stream, um, greeting to those four viewers at home, uh, we're going to hopefully get up to five viewers sometime. Um, but so this is a really important topic. And I think just if you're an observer, you're going to appreciate uh, where substance abuse efforts are, what they're doing, some things they wish they could do. We're also going to discuss some organizational matters. Um, and just for the lay of the land for the day, we're going to spend just about, well, the next 55 minutes uh, talking about March, their substance abuse, a uh, piece of legislation they have. And right around 2, we're going to stop that discussion and spend 15 minutes on a proposed reorganization of um, the Behavioral Health Department at DHS. And that's going to be more of a presentation of the idea. We're not going to discuss it a lot today. The discussions will happen in the hallways and around. Uh, we're not going to vote on anything today either. And then the final uh, segment will talk about uh, the future of how we should uh, encourage regular, uh, recovery community organizations. And so um, I think um, all those are going to be really interesting. Uh, and uh, nothing's been decided. Uh, on all these projects, but except that we care about the people who need to be served and that they be served in the uh, the best possible way. So, um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Ms. Delwell, welcome to the committee. Um, and uh, so we're just a few minutes late, but I, uh, we're going to try to get down to this by two, counting the presentation from Senator Wickland. We're not going to be voting on that bill today. Uh, but we, so we're just going to want the highlights, and then as we decide what parts we're actually going to try to take up and talk about, that'll be for a, a later time. So uh, welcome, Ms. Delwell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amy Delwell, and you may know me as the Vice President of Public Policy at New Way. Uh, but today I'm presenting as the President-elect of March. The March members and those here to speak today are grateful for the precious committee time that you're giving to hear this topic. Uh, we've dubbed this bill uh, Pathways to Recovery. And there's a handout in your uh, packet uh, that shows that this is not always a linear path. I wanted to show my screen uh, quickly. And uh, let's see here. I need to go to, thank you. Uh, we have a, a friend, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mark Jonigan, uh, who was a board member of ours. Uh, and uh, he was the embodiment, if you will, of, um, of recovery. And uh, he started Twin Cities Recovery Project about um, three years ago, four years ago, uh, after finding uh, recovery himself. And uh, he sadly lost his uh, life in a fatal car accident in December. And uh, so today we wanted to honor uh, Mark with, um, with our testimony. We want to uh, thank uh, Senator Wickland for authoring this bill and the co-authors that uh, will be signing on uh, shortly thereafter. There's a couple headlines that I wanted to kind of set the stage. These are recent headlines. And um, I wanted to be sure that, that people kind of kept those in mind along the way. The first one is that more than a million Americans have died from an overdose during this opioid epidemic. And so for context, the COVID um, deaths have not reached that grim milestone yet. Uh, alcohol consumption during the COVID-19 pandemic is projected to cause more liver disease and deaths. And we don't often talk about all the ways that substance use disorder impacts a person's health. But, um, and then a uh, new addiction stigma index is a call to action for us and recovery advocates everywhere. 
more than 75% of the people that um, Shatterproof did a uh, survey of did not believe that chronic uh, SUD was a chronic disease. And so with that, I'd like to um, stop sharing my screen here and turn things over to Dr. John Kelly. He's going to help us kind of orient to SUD as a chronic disease. And uh, Dr. Kelly, if you'll show your screen and begin your testimony, thank you. Well, welcome Dr. Kelly and um, you know, reality is being what it is if uh, you can, it's nice you can be here. And so good news, I'll just need you for 10 minutes. So uh, I know you're trying to fit a lifetime of work into 10 minutes, how hard could that be? Uh, welcome <laughs> to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee members. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, as, uh, as Amy mentioned, I'm going to uh, kind of hopefully put you in the picture quickly of why it's important to address addiction as a chronic illness. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> some of you may, may remember 50 years ago, um, I was alive then, just about uh, living in a different country, but uh, there was a declaration of the war on drugs under President Nixon. Uh, we marked the 50 year milestone of that actually yesterday, uh, sorry, last year. Um, and a, a lot has happened in this 50, past 50 years, and including uh, the increased recognition of the necessity to treat addiction as a chronic illness. Now, how did we get here? Um, we've learned a lot, obviously, in the last 50 years. We've seen the birth of the National Institutes of Health on addiction, on alcohol addiction and other drug addiction. Now, as a result of all the research that's been produced over the last 50 years, courtesy of the American taxpayer, because uh, pretty much we've learned 90% of what we know about addiction has been learned uh, because of NIAAA and NIDA uh, in the United States. We've learned a lot about the complexity of the onset, the etiology, the genetic contribution of addiction the neurobiological impact, why we understand addiction to be a disease that affects the neurocircuitry and structure of the brain, which of course explains why this is a psychiatric illness because it results in impaired control over the impulse to use alcohol or other drugs despite uh, severe consequences. We've understood about the epidemiology, the risk factors associated with the onset, as well as the pathways into, through, and outside and out the other side of addiction, including its treatment. Um, I think nowadays we're used to seeing images like this showing the neural plasticity of the brain. This is a fairly new insight into how our brain changes beyond our mid twenties, which up till 30 years ago, we thought it was pretty static. We also have learned through this imaging technology, how the brain is radically affected by exposure to drugs and alcohol. Uh, not just functionally, but also structurally. Uh, the good news is, is that when you remove uh, the toxin, when the drug is removed from the brain, we see recovery in the brain. Uh, it can take many months, even years, for the brain to look like a normal brain. But Mother Nature can do her work uh, once recovery is initiated. We understand now also that the reason why it is so difficult for people to initiate and sustain recovery is because of two physiological processes that uh, happen as a result of chronic exposure to alcohol or other drugs. This results in an increased sensitivity to stress and also a double whammy of a, a decreased capacity to experience normal levels of reward. And imagine that combination. So you're not only hypersensitive to stress in these early months and early years of recovery, but also have a down-regulated capacity to experience normal reward. And this trips people up. It makes it very difficult for people to initiate and sustain remission early on. Uh, we, we sometimes refer to this as protracted withdrawal or post-acute withdrawal phenomena. And these manifest in different ways in terms of cognitive difficulties, as well as um, neurovegetative symptoms, difficulty sleeping, concentrating, uh, appetite problems, um, which we often see, which can uh, trip people up. Uh, this perhaps better explains what we've learned about the time course and why we understand now addiction as a chronic illness and why we are moving towards treating it as such. If you look in the middle of this diagram, you'll see the eight year mark. Now, what that signifies is approximately, it takes eight years from clinical samples. When we look prospectively and retrospectively, cross-sectionally, 
at different data sets that have been uh, collected on different individuals with an alcohol or other drug use disorder, it takes roughly eight years uh, to get one year of full sustained remission after people start to seek help. And it takes about, on average, four to five treatment episodes for people to achieve that one year of full sustained remission, that's 12 months without symptoms. What's also noteworthy, however, if you look on the right-hand side here, you see that five-year uh, mark. Uh, what that signifies is that it takes another five years after people achieve remission to be uh, for the risk of meeting criteria for a substance use disorder in the following year to drop below 15%. Why 15%? Because 15% is the annual risk in the general population of anybody meeting criteria for an alcohol or other drug use disorder. So to be no more likely than anybody else in the general population of meeting criteria for an alcohol or drug use disorder in the following year, if you've already had it, takes roughly four to five years of continuous remission. This means that risk remains elevated even after people have achieved that huge milestone of achieving that first year of remission. And this is why we are moving towards a chronic model or, or disease management model of substance use disorder so that we can help support, not just for 30 days, not just for 90 days, but really providing levels of recovery management and recovery monitoring across this five year period. The question of course is, can we speed this up? Other things that we can do to accelerate the time to initial remission and to stable remission? I think the answer is we are learning. The answer is definitely yes. I often use this uh, analogy of a, of a burning building to describe kind of where we've come and where we need to go in terms of addressing the emergency situation, which seems to be all, always with us of alcohol and other drug problems. We've seen it most readily, of course, most recently with the opioid crisis. But if we've done anything right in the last 50 years, it's recognized that we have an emergency situation. We know how to put the fire out. We've learned to put the fire out very well. We know how to detoxify and stabilize people and provide acute care treatment over a period of 12 weeks. 90% of all of our clinical trials have been no more than 12 weeks of treatment and then the treatment is removed. This is acute care model of treatment. And we've done that very well but we are recognizing what we need to also provide is once the fire is out, what do we do next? Once someone has been detoxified and stabilized, what do we need to do? And the answer is it, it, we need to provide the building material so that people can start to rebuild their life. And very importantly, the scaffolding, and perhaps most importantly, the building permit that people need. Oftentimes people have a felony conviction related to their drug or alcohol use, which prevents them from getting a foothold in recovery, it keeps those doors shut. They can't get a bank account, they can't get a loan, they can't get housing because of prior criminal convictions. And this is a major barrier uh, that people face in addition to uh, uh, being able to ac access building materials, what we call, call now recovery capital. These are things like housing, job training, education, things that can instill hope for people, help them stabilize and find a foothold in recovery. Um, they can also uh, affect the brain's neurocircuitry. So we know that in the neuroscience of recovery capital, that friends, jobs, and housing actually change the brain. They accelerate upregulation of these downregulated uh, uh, dopamine pathways in the brain. So what we have learned is that addressing the clinical pathology in acute care treatment models is absolutely critical. Putting the fire out has been absolutely life-saving and critical. But where we've dropped the ball is recognizing what people need over this first year and over this first five years in terms of recovery management and recovery monitoring. And so greater access to these resources, housing, jobs, social capital, um, that people can use to, to get traction and still hope uh, are also being addressed now at the national level and the federal level. With uh, the, the, just, just, just before the end of the year last year, you may have seen that SAMHSA is now um, just um, officially announced the Office of Recovery, uh, which will look at recovery support services with a 10% set aside specifically for recovery support services. So thank you for your, for your time. Wow, uh, that was a really um, good summary. And um, you didn't even take the whole 10 minutes. That, that was just fascinating. Um,
So, uh, and helpful, I think, even just in its simplicity. I, I like the, the chart in particular uh, with this, uh, whatever you call this little chart guy here with uh, the times. And, and so people think they're two or three years down the road, Dr. Kelly, and um, that could be some false confidence. Is that what you're telling us? Well, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> of course, even after, even after five years, of course, it doesn't, the risk is not zero. Um, it's still less than 15%. Uh, in other words, you know, no greater risk than the general population of reading criteria for substance use disorder. But that risk for the first five years remains elevated relative to the general population. So one has to be careful, of course, at all yeah. times and maintain that vigilance. But we do know that providing access to these recovery resources is, increases the probability that someone will maintain permission through that five-year period. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that. Are you going to be sticking around, or do you have to run off and do some other things before? I have, to, I have to run off, but I'm happy to provide any other uh, testimonial materials at another time. Yeah, no, I, I, this has been, oh, I really like that chart. Um, so I want to get that printed out. Everybody should look at that chart, that one I pointed out. So thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, you bet. Thank great. you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. God bless Thanks. your Thanks work. Thanks a lot. Um, so... Uh, so now we're going to hear, so the next, I think there's four other people that are going to talk for about five minutes apiece. And I just want to caution each of those four testifiers that five minutes goes quicker than you think. Um, so uh, uh, Anderson St. George's, um, is that the right name? Uh, and then we'll just go down the list of Ms. Uh, Brookmeyer, uh, Ms. Lanhart, and then Dr. Bart. So um, I'll, I'll call on each of you, but go ahead, um, please. Hello. Mr. Welcome. Chairperson, my name is Anderson St. George's. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and certified prevention professional working in uh, rural Minnesota. I am the executive director at Compassion Health Treatment Services and Daystar Recovery Center located in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. I completed my master's in addiction studies at Hazel Dan Bedford Graduate School of Addiction Studies and I have been working in World Minnesota for five years. I am a March board member and co-chair of the World Health and Disparities Committee, which mission is to identify and document disparities in, service, in services in World Minnesota, determine barriers that cause them, and recommend policies to overcome them. Today, I will be speaking about how the day-to-day -day burden of managing caseload and duplicative documentation decreased therapeutic relationship with clients, increase higher risk of burnout and compassion fatigue. Furthermore, I will be advocating for a holiday hour to be permitted in residential sites in order to encourage personal self-care and family time, both for counselors and clients. The first topic I would like to advocate for is eliminating duplicated documentation and extending documentation timeline for significant events will increase client staff interaction and therapeutic relationship. During my years of working as counselor, I found it fascinating how direct care staff that are in charge of supervising clients often have a better therapeutic relationship with clients more than the clinicians responsible for teaching the clients the positive coping skills they need to work a long-term program of recovery. Upon asking my clients why they feel comfortable sharing privileged clinical information with direct care staff, some of my clients reported that they feel that they can be real with the direct care staff. They feel that they can interact with direct care staff and have genuine one-on-one -on -one conversation without feeling like someone is documenting their behavior. Per my clinical observation, I believe the clients are right. Working in rural Minnesota, where LADC shortage and workforce crisis have been exacerbated by COVID-19, at times, I found myself screening clients completing intakes, providing orientation, leading group counseling, doing crisis management, and transporting clients. By the time I'm done providing the services listed above, I barely have time to document the, the group that I provided for the services uh, provided to the client. In some residential treatment facility, some counselors may have up to 10 or more clients on their caseload. It may take up to 40% of their counselors time running group doing case management, by the time they are done with all the services listed above, they are exhausted. So today, one of my 
you know, things I would like to advocate for is an extension for a significant event where in lieu for the counselor to document the event right away, I recommend that we have an extension for 24 hours so that the counselor can provide crisis management, help the client um, manage their emotion, practice positive coping skills, and later come back and document these events so that we can remain in compliance with um, DHS. Furthermore, I would like to advocate for a 28 days um, treatment plan review. As of now, we are recommended to update our treatment um, plan review on a weekly basis. However, the duplicative documentation can be at time exhausting and taking time away from being with the client. Uh, for example, when you have an intake, you have to provide um, what we call comprehensive assessment, comprehensive assessment summary. Three days later, you have to do comprehensive assessment review, comprehensive assessment summary review. You have to provide individual counsel which you document and each group counseling you provide services for your document. However, at the end of the week, you will have to review all this documentation and put them in one big documentation called treatment plan review in order to be in compliance. I have to note that the mental health providers, they have up to 180 days to do a treatment re plan review. As a result, we would like to recommend 28 days for treatment plan review so that the counselors can take time and get to know their clients better. As the program director that I work as a counselor, I can tell you that in my years of experience, I developed the approach named recovery in action, where I take clients fishing, I take clients play, play frisbee golf, I take clients exercise, I take them for nature walk, and making sure that they practice the positive coping skills they learned in treatment. During my time one-on-one -on -one with those clients, I get to know more about those clients. They let their guard down and I can know what I can use to work with them. Um, the second point I would like to advocate about is permitting holiday hour relief will increase personal self-care, time with family, and decrease compassion fatigue. Self-care is not selfish. I believe that it is important for counselors to spend time with their family during federal holiday. It is important for the counselors to feel that they can disconnect. Also, it can be beneficial for the clients to take the day to spend with family and be able to practice positive coping skills that learned in treatment. As of now, if we were to have a federal holiday that is in the middle of the week, if you have a client on high intensity, you are supposed to provide 30 hours, medium intensity, 15 hours. I think it would be beneficial for the counselors to be able to take a day off during the federal holiday, practice some self-care, and for the clients to be able to be in the community, be with their family if it is conducive to their recovery, and be able to take that time off without having to complete the whole at 30 hours and we can still build for it. So um, that's um, what I would like to advocate for, and that's my testimony. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. St. George's, and I really find this really helpful. Um, Ms. Uh, Brokemeyer, did I say it right? Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Sadie Brockmeyer and I'm the president at Recovering Hope Treatment Center, a residential substance use facility for women, women and children, and pregnant women. I'm a licensed drug and alcohol counselor and mental health therapist in the state of Minnesota. I work as an adjunct professor at Anoka Ramsey Community College in the Drug and Alcohol Studies program. I also serve as a representative on the March Board for Region 3. Today I'm speaking about the Article 2 proposed changes for the March proposal. The areas covered in this article pertain to workforce shortages and unattainable ratios that impact our ability to provide the care that clients deserve and receive appropriate funding for these services. When I'm teaching my students about working in the field of behavioral health, I often speak about the differences between theory and practice. I feel this comparison describes the challenges we have between the theory of statute and the practice of counseling. These intentions with the statutes are to provide safety and clarity for those we serve. However, these statutes often have immense barriers on the way that we provide care. We are seeing the impact and lack of access, that lack of access to care and harmful policies are having in our communities with a large increase in overdoses in 2020. And this statistic doesn't even begin to describe the continued impact of other substances like alcohol and methamphetamine, both of which are the most common substances of choice for those admitting to treatment services in the state of Minnesota, according to Dane's data. 
Later on, Ms. Silverness will be talking about the proposed language changes as it relates to program hours. I'm going to focus on the impact of the interpretation the statutes have on the provider's ability to provide client-centered care. Each program is required to provide 30, 15, or 6 hours of programming for each client depending on what level of care that client is in. Most programs provide 30 to 45 hours of programming per week for a high intensity client. The reason programs offer more than what is required is because the state does not determine program hours based off of what is offered. They determine it based off the hours the clients attend. This creates many barriers for clients as there are lots of client-centered reasons that somebody might not attend program hours. For example, a woman that delivers a baby in our program usually returns to the program two to three days after delivery. And in order for our facility to be reimbursed for the services that the client receives, she needs to attend 30 hours of programming if she's on high intensity. If she's not able to make those hours, we are only able to bill for a board and lodge service or a lower level of care, despite this client receiving more individual support through our daycare staff, direct care staff, and other medical team members, including more transportation for to and from the local clinic for appropriate follow-up care for her and child. There are other reasons, uh, client-centered reasons, that a client may not make their program hours. For example, court, meeting with attorneys, child visitation that can only be scheduled during the child protection workers working off hours, which is usually the same as program hours, illness or challenges with mental health or behavioral concerns. The clients that are not making their hours are usually the clients that are more acute and in need of the most outside support outside of group programming. This then becomes a decision for staff on whether to discharge the client or transfer them for non-compliance or not receive appropriate funding for the services. Another barrier to providing care is the co-occurring co ratios for facilities. Currently, one of the requirements to receiving funding for providing co-occurring services is the amount of mental health staff you have to have in ratio to the amount of drug and alcohol counselors you have on staff. It is not dependent on the amount of clients that you are serving. It also has restrictions on what type of providers can be included um, as a mental health provider. The theory or statute behind the ratio is to ensure that there is enough mental health coverage for those in need. However, the practice, the way that it's calculated, has many barriers. It impacts facilities by not being able to hire additional drug and alcohol counselors to reduce their caseload size because then they would have to hire more on the mental health side. So it's this ever balance that you have. It impacts the amount of drug and alcohol students that they can take to complete their practicum because they have to make sure they can, again, balance those hours out. It also impacts the ability to take on pre-licensed supervisees because there's only a certain amount of pre-licensed staff that you can have on your mental health side. Do you members know how long it takes to become a fully licensed mental health provider in the state of Minnesota? At least two years. In addition to that, it takes an additional two years to become a board certified supervisor, leaving a four year gap before those that are pre-licensed to being fully licensed. With the workforce short shortage being how it is, it is challenging to find fully licensed individuals and even more challenging to find those that want to work in a residential setting for substance use. Many therapists working on their license, um, license will start their careers in a substance use facility and gain experience and then when they're fully licensed, move into administrative roles, private practice, or mental health primary employment. I put this on the paperwork. Um, but currently there is such a need for therapists and licensed staff that the organizations are offering up to $15,000 in hiring bonuses. By eliminating the current language and allowing for organizations to dictate the amount of availability that staff work, uh, that staff that works for their program would allow an immediate change and have a positive impact on the client, uh, client services. And finally, the workforce shortage correlates with the proposed language to have a license that allows individuals to practice once they complete their internship and prior to the board approving their license. Currently, those in internships complete their application, gather all of the appropriate documents, and have them ready to mail into the board the day that their grades are posted. Despite most students being proactive in their submission, it can take 30 to 90 days for the board to approve the license, which means these individuals aren't able to work during that time. Some facilities may hire them on as a licensing candidate to do busy work like data entry or a paraprofessional role, usually at the pay rate of a drug and alcohol counselor until their license is approved or not hire them 
which then leads them to go to the larger providers who can afford to hire them for the busy work till their license comes in. It also interrupts the care of our clients as clients have to transition to a new counselor until that license is approved. Mr. Chair and members, this concludes my portion of the presentation and I thank you for your time. Well, thank you and I, th I think it's very helpful uh, dialogue. So um, next we have uh, Ms. Lanhart and if you can try to fit into four minutes, that'd be nice and same for Dr. Bart. So um, welcome uh, and I, I would appreciate that no one's repeating themselves. So I mean, there's, it's such a massive topic. We're just fitting this whole big thing into a space that fits this time. but critically important. So uh, Ms. Lanhart, welcome to the committee. Thank you and good afternoon, um, Senator Ebling and members of the committee. My name is Pam Lanhart. I'm the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Thrive Family Recovery Resources, which was founded seven years ago specifically to assist families impacted by their loved one's substance use disorder. Of special note, in October 2021, I was the recipient of the Faces and Voices Vernon Johnson Award for my work in family advocacy. Thank you for allowing me to speak before your committee today. My job all day, every day, is to help families respond to substance use disorder with compassion, kindness, and empathy using evidence-based invitational practices in an effort to reduce harm in their families. What we know is that for every person impacted by substance use, there are at least three people peripherally impacted. That equates to approximately 75 million people in our country suffering as a result of substance use in their families. Our organization was born of, out of our personal experience in dealing with our young son who started using substances at the age of 12 and entered treatment for the first time at 15. Jake was a man who loved the outdoors. When things were hard, we would go out to the mountain and climb together as a family and we would all find connection and peace at the top of a 14er. His goal was to summit all 58 14er peaks in Colorado. Jake was a hard worker and was one of the kindest human beings I know. He lit up a room when he entered it and more than anything, he wanted sobriety. He wanted recovery. He was willing 12 different times to enter treatment in an effort to not die. In the early morning hours of October 23rd, after saving his friend's life with naloxone, Jake made the fatal decision to smoke half of a little blue pill marked M30. He was just 24 years old. In Minnesota this year, we have seen a 38% increase in overdose deaths. That equates to an estimated 1,188 human lives. And the data from May 2020 to May 2021 indicates the most alarming increase in overdose deaths in any one year period. These are not numbers, however, they are human beings. They are people like my son, people with mothers and fathers, partners and children who cared for them and loved them. Our family had very few barriers in getting our son the acute treatment care that he needed for his disease, and yet he still died. And I have to wonder today, as I listen to Dr. John Kelly and others as they gave their testimony, that if some of the supports that are proposed in this bill had existed, that my son had his first, when my son had his first treatment experience at the age of 15 or the second or the third or even the fourth, that perhaps he would be alive today. Quite frankly, my heart broke as I listened to him and recalled the difficulties for my son, not with accessing treatment, but sustaining long-term recovery. Every day I hear stories from families I work with expressing the frustrations that exist as it pertains to barriers that prevent their loved ones from accessing treatment when that small window of opportunity presents itself. The frustration of their loved ones getting proper care while they are in treatment due to staffing shortages and lack of reimbursement in certain areas and the difficulties of finding those scaffoldings of support that are necessary to sustain long-term recovery. In our case, our son would be successful for six months or even nine months, but every time he fell into a pattern where at the nine or 12 month mark, 
he started to falter and we faced another reoccurrence of views. We did not have the financial resources to pay for private recovery coaches, private therapists, and the necessities that financial means provides. One of the things I want to mention here is that in our state where opiates are prevalent, one of the most significant barriers are recovery supports for those people choosing medicated assisted recovery. Aftercare housing for people on medications presents one of the greatest barriers to long-term recovery. Families want to help their loved ones. Families are the first responders for their loved ones who are suffering, and they look to our community for the help that they need for their loved ones. The bill in front of you highlights some of the difficulties that our system experiences in order to provide proper care for our family members, whether it's in the process of directly accessing treatment, caring for those individuals who are providing services to our families, or the supports that are needed in order for our families to continue their recovery for an extended period of time outside the structure of a residential treatment program. There are amazing professionals in the field who are dedicated and committed to providing the highest level of care possible and professionals who are committed to removing barriers that exist. The testimony of those you have heard today providing that direct care to our loved ones matters. We have to do better for the families of Minnesota. These changes that are proposed will save lives. Mr. Chair and members, this concludes my portion of the testimony. Thank you for your time and attention. Thanks to Ms. Lanhard. What was your son's name? Or what is your son's name? It's Jake. First name? Jake up. Yeah. I'm just, I can't even talk. Um, thank you. Uh, that's why we're here today. That's why we're pushing on the system and then these three bills it has to work. It just has to work. Uh, Dr. Bart, uh, you're unfortunately at the end of the line here. Do you think you could kind of highlight things in, um, yeah. in, uh, speak in, in for about three minutes and just tell us? I mean, it's anyway, it's been profound testimony so far, and you'll be even more amazing. So welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good, good thing I can speak quickly here. So Mr. Chairman and committee members, thank you. I'm Gavin Bart. I'm a physician specializing in internal medicine and addiction medicine at Hennepin Healthcare, where I direct the Division of Addiction Medicine. And you've heard a pretty stark picture of substance use in Minnesota that I see every day as a practitioner. And the reality is that the use of tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs are the leading preventable cause of death on the planet. And so we need to make sure that we can address this problem across all spectrums of Minnesota. Now, well, the minority people who use substances have an addiction, this minority disproportionately requires healthcare services, government assistance, supportive housing, and are too often caught up in that criminal justice system. And in Minnesota, we have more than 300,000 people who are, are in need of but not receiving treatment for a substance use disorder. And only about 25% of those with an opioid use disorder are receiving highly effective life-saving medications. And so we continue to see needless and preventable year-over-year -year increases in overdose deaths. Now, my patients frequently are denied residential treatment and sober housing because of blanket bans on buprenorphine and methadone, and highly effective medications to treat opioid addiction. And criminal justice records further impede safe housing. So we must ensure that being locked up because of a mental health or an addiction history isn't turning into being locked out of housing because of one's record. Because how can we expect anyone to recover if they don't know where they're gonna be sleeping from night to night? So we know addiction is a disease and that people with addiction deserve access to qualified health professionals, yet we're in the great resignation. People are leaving the field or not wanting to enter it. Root causes include low reimbursement rates, keeping salaries quite low, huge student loan debts, and increased documentation burdens, which you've already uh, heard about. My Staff who leave tell me they feel it's no longer about the patients and now it's about the paperwork. And we need to revise redundant paperwork in order uh, to allow staff and health professionals to spend time with those in need, the patients that they wanna work with. We need greater harmonization of rules to streamline the paperwork. We need loan repayment programs 
And we need a system that allows people to do work as soon as they are ready to after graduation and not have to wait until the backlog of licensing is cleared. Finally, we need an adaptive system that can adjust to the patient's needs when they need it, that understands addiction as a chronic illness like diabetes, depression, or sickle cell disease, and doesn't just fit treatment episodes into 28 day or 12 week periods. We need access for patients when the wheels are wobbling, not just after they've crashed. And they need best practices. So for example, methamphetamine is the largest growing illicit substance use problem in Minnesota, and they need access to the most effective treatment, which for that is contingency management, a program based on Nobel Prize economic theory that incentivizes positive behavior and goal achievement, yet it's unavailable in Minnesota because we're too slow to transform our care delivery system, billing and coding and reimbursement systems to meet evolving evidence. So if we are to limit the impact of drugs in Minnesota, we must be nimble, we must be efficient, and we must be ready to meet the patients where they are at and when they need our help. Much of what is being proposed to you today is cost neutral and some will require investment it's my hope this body will adopt these changes so Minnesota can reduce the devastating impact of drugs and alcohol and reap the benefit of the population revitalizing recovery. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And, um, you know, you, you go into a day of a hearing, you think, oh, it's going to be interesting, and then it's just compelling. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Wickland, uh, we have 15 minutes. I think we're doing pretty well for time, and I wouldn't have shortened up the testifiers by 10 seconds if I even given the time. I think it's all been extremely solid, quality, meaty testimony. And I think if you've done, if you know nothing about this topic uh, in the last 40 minutes, you learn quite a bit about this, the challenges. So Senator Wickland, um, I think you have two people that are helping you or a couple. Um, so if you want to just, uh, we're not going to move the bill today and we're not going to move the amendment, but if you would kind of just whatever comments you want to make at this point, uh, and then for the, for the people presenting the bill, rather than go by Article 1, Article 2, Section 1, kind of tell us the highlights of the changes you think that need to be made that are expressed in your bill. Like we've already heard about the, you know, the, the, the times and the days and so, and so on like that. And so we're going to get into the meat of this at a later time. We're going to attempt to pass out everything we can pass out of this committee. Whatever makes sense that we can, you know, get done. So, at, but at a later time. So Senator Wickland, thank you for carrying this bill and for being such a big part of this important topic. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate um, being able to carry the bill, and I appreciate that uh, we were able to have um, this time today. Um, we can tell that this is absolutely a crisis that we need to address, and, and that certainly um, hearing the testimony today gives me a feeling of a uh, sense of urgency that we, we do everything we can to address the issues that we're, we're seeing in the system. and. Um, trying to help as many people as we can. Um, yeah, I, um, I have an understanding of um, there's three people are going to talk about the bill. I also wanted to mention that there, there is an author's amendment that um, we, we have also, and um, at a later date, you know, we'll, if the bill comes back, you know, for kind of official presentation, you know, we can go through that and hopefully describe how it fits into the um, the Senate file 3062 and um, and as you've heard through the testimony um, the bill contains kind of a multifaceted approach to addressing the problems that we face um, there's three sections um, and I believe that the speakers are going to talk about them by article but um, since some of the provisions have already been described, um, I'm assuming that the three of them will kind of highlight um, the article, highlight them by article, but not go into the detail because, yes, as you mentioned, some of it has already been discussed. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy Delwo, and then there's also Tina Silverness and Brian Zerbees are going to present as well. So thank you. Hello, Mr. Chair. Uh, Amy Delwell, uh, for the record, once again. Uh, and Ms. Delwell, I'm sorry, my voice was off there. Um, it's off anyway. I'm just still compelled by Jake's story. Um, 
So if you can just, you can go by article, but if you more just tell us a story about the things that this bill would help accomplish, like the times and the, and the, the days off and the 30 hour, you know, stuff like that. So just kind of go through like that. We're gonna get into the weeds on all the details, but I think that it would even be more productive for you in helping us understand what you're trying to do with the bill, just like the, the mm -hmm. does that help you? So go ahead, and then you have some Absolutely. other helpers. And so um, yes. I think just given time, uh, just uh, Ms. Silverness or Mr. Zerbys, just feel free to, t Amy, just kind of tag off with them and I'll let you run the next uh, 10 yeah, minutes. Thanks. Excellent. So Mr. Chair, I think some good context for the first article is that um, in preparation for this bill, uh, there was uh, focus groups conducted with 400 clients or patients who are currently in treatment and 90% of them were um, eligible for medical assistance. And they are really the ones who informed Article 1. And really um, Article 1 is looking at what do we do in that post-acute phase um, for long-term recovery. And, and that's really what the goal of, of Article 1 is. So a couple things that I'll highlight that you may not have heard in testimony already. The first section is related to housing fidelity bonds. And basically what this does is capitalize on a program that is already existing through DEED that is um, an employee fidelity program. And um, the Department of Employee and Economic Development would like to actually extend this program to housing fidelity bonds. What it will do is help people who do have um, limited rest, uh, rental history or had acquired um, a criminal background while they were in the midst of their addiction, help them to get into rental housing. The second uh, uh, thing that I wanted to mention is birth certificate and state issued IDs. In essence, we're requesting that um, those fees be waived for medical assistance eligible people um, because oftentimes uh, our folks have been speaking to being homeless or couch surfing uh, during the six months prior to their um, uh, entry into treatment and uh, they lose these things. And in order to kind of gain that foothold in recovery, they need, uh, they need these documents once again. In terms of individual counseling, uh, Dr. Kelly talked about, you know, this is not an episodic uh, disease, that once you've completed treatment, it's not over. And uh, there's a lot of administrative barriers right now to accessing the counselor that you already spent the last three months or four months building a relationship with, building a trusting relationship with. And what this section does is help that person to uh, be able to maintain that therapeutic connection post-discharge at their discretion in terms of connecting with that person. And then um, section seven, uh, just wanted to highlight that this is the recovery capital once again that Dr. Kelly spoke of in terms of assuring that people post-treatment have access to housing, transportation, food, childcare in a braided way so that people can focus on their recovery and their remission immediately after treatment. Um, guest speakers, basically right now, um, I'll give a, a quick scenario. Uh, a counselor can show uh, a TED talk in uh, their group and that's a reimbursable hour. But if you actually invite TED in and it's not an LADC, the department doesn't reimburse that as, as a reimbursable service. And so if the counselor is not in recovery, then um, they may invite somebody in to talk about recovery. And so that's why we're trying to move this section forward. And finally, um, reporting and access. Substance use disorder for years, the providers have been um, providing a lot of data to the Department of Human Services, but they get little to no data back. And so the fact that we're in an evidence-based, data-driven decision-making environment right now, substance use disorder providers are still trying to get basic data on an annual basis. I'm going to toss it over to Tina quick. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tina Silverness, and I'm the CEO here at the Center for Alcohol and Drug Treatment in Duluth. Um, so I just want to talk briefly. Um, Sadie covered a lot of what is in um, Article 2, the continuity of work between former interns and alcohol and drug counselors licensure approval. This, process, uh, this proposal would allow former LADC students a 90-day window to practice from the from the date of the student's de 
Greek conferral and under the supervision um, of that agency. Uh, the next thing that Sadie discussed was the flexibility in residential treatment hours and the co-occurring credentialed staff. This proposal would provide a means for programs to get reimbursed when the patient is unable to attend all their weekly programming for all the various legitimate reasons why they mentioned, why Sadie mentioned. Um, and it would also allow providers to determine the adequate staffing complement for their co-occurring programs as long as they met the basic requirements. Um, and then the, in 2021, uh, the Commissioner of Human Services was directed to conduct a substance use rate disorder, or a disorder rate methodology. Um, and because the rates have basically held flat for the last 12 years, and it's much overdue. So this proposal would provide a temporary rate increase of 14% if the new rate setting process um, had not been, um, has not been implemented. The intention of this proposal is really to ensure that providers aren't being held in limbo indefinitely for rate adjustments due to DHS delays. And the final thing in article two um, is the substance use disorder direct care increase. Uh, this proposal would allow a 10% base rate increase for direct care staff. Essentially, what we're asking is that if the legislature implements workforce solutions with rate increases for direct care, um, for care industries, SUD providers would like to be included in on that. And that is all I have, and I will throw it over to Brian. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Zervis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Brian Zervis with North Star Behavioral Health, a substance disorder organization in Minnesota. I also serve as a co-chair of Marsh's Government Affairs Committee. In Article 3, there's five sections. Uh, in there, I'm only going to touch on three of them since the other uh, documentation ones are already spoken to. Um, the Article 3 is focusing on service preservation and access. One of the sections is related to withdrawal management programs. Uh, these are uh, residential facilities that stabilize people that are intoxicated or in withdrawal. Currently, those programs need to have a it's called a supervised living facility class B license, which is for non-ambulatory people. Um, this section would also add class A, which are for people that are ambulatory. Um, for context on the documentation articles already testified to, I wanted to provide some data uh, that March has collected from clinicians, uh, specifically around treatment planning. Uh, clinicians spend on average 4.5 hours per week on treatment planning and Currently with the weekly treatment plan reviews, about half the time they're doing treatment plans, there are no changes or no updates needed, uh, but it's still required to complete. There's uh, in section five of this article, currently the commissioner publishes an annual report on reimbursement rates uh, that managed care and county-based purchasing plans make, uh, pay for dental services, physician, hospital, and mental health services. This section would add in substance use disorder services to that reporting list. Um, having this data on reimbursement rates uh, will help inform policymakers on the substance disorder reimbursement for services. The last part of this article in section six is uh, requesting to extend a, the deadline for the paperwork reduction report. Uh, the past legislative session directed a report to be completed by this December. Uh, the, the funding for that report was recently approved uh, in January, which means the timelines to select a vendor, work with providers, and develop a report uh, are, are not feasible. Um, so uh, uh, this section would add, uh, seek to add a, a two-year window after a vendor is selected to be able to work with providers to effectively review and analyze and bring forth recommendations on a, a more robust paper reduction proposal. Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, March appreciates the time and attention you devoted to this, uh, to the preventive treatment and recovery efforts for all in Minnesota. We look forward to continued engagement and support to improve the quality and effectiveness of substance disorder services. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, Ms. Stelwell, is that the end of your presentation? Or do you want to have a, because I have a couple minutes for a few comments. So. Uh, Senator Nelson, and we're going to stop in three minutes. So uh, just if you wanted to, yeah, go ahead and say something, and then we'll see who else has a chance to say something. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, for Mr. Uh, Zerbes, I just have a question. I read over the bill, and I was just looking at that section four there, 
in Article 3, and I really didn't understand that piece. It seems like that's very important to keep a record of the um, treatment plan, what the plan was, and what the, uh, what the client's response was. And so I'm just curious as to why that um, would be removed as a requirement. I understand there's challenges in paperwork. I definitely do, and we don't want to uh, overdo uh, unnecessary paperwork. But this seems like, a, like the bread and butter of, of what would be helpful in uh, working with a client. So I wonder if you Zerbis. could adjust, uh, address that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Shooter, Senator Nelson, in, um, so in Subdivision 3, what it looks like the documentation of treatment services is being removed. Um, it, it's actually splitting out documentation requirements from the treatment plan review. So in the, the new expectation is that the treatment plan review would still happen. The uh, components of a treatment plan review would still be um, captured, but the, the big component would be instead of having to be every seven days, to be every 28 days. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you for the clarification on the timing. Uh, 20, 28 days is a long time, though, uh, to, to not have that a piece in there, I think. But uh, thank you for the clarification. Well, and I want to thank everybody for your, your work on this today. Um, and so what we have is a system that looks like this. A bunch of paper, a bunch of rules, and at the end, you have Jake. So how do you make this help this? And I know a bunch of Jakes. And it, it, and so I'll go, oh, may there never be another one. There's going to be another one. And how do we help it to be less, and how do we wish it could be never? And so the purpose of today was to, Senator Wicklund, thank you for bringing this bill forward. We're absolutely going to work on it and do all we can do to make it work so that at least fewer people have to grieve. And that's the purpose of the next parts we're coming up to. And I think we are choked with this. And for all the good intentions and all the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars that we put forward, it doesn't stop this. And so hopefully the next two discussions will be with that in mind. Um, and so Senator Murphy, you can be part of the transition comment if you like, and then we're gonna move into the next thing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I hope this is considered a transition comment. Uh, okay, well, whatever you get to. You, get to <laughs> you decide. <laughs> uh, I, I I am always grateful for uh, expressions of humanity uh, in this building. We often hear it from the people who testify, um, but not always as much from the people who are listening. So. I want to acknowledge uh, the human reaction that you are having. It's important to me. And I think it's probably important to Minnesotans as well. Um, and I want to draw our attention not only to the photo of Jake, but also to the comments of Dr. Kelly at the start. And probably part of the problem that we're experiencing uh, and the solution if we want to avoid any more lost life is to recognize that substance abuse is a disorder, it's a disease, and we treat it uh, like we're gonna take out someone's gallbladder instead of treating it for its chronicity and the long-term recovery that's required. Um, and the paperwork is a part of that for sure. Um, but I, I think Dr. Kelly you know, set us up right here at the start, uh, and I'm grateful for the work that the committee's gonna do for Senator Wickland uh, for leading this effort. Uh, and I'm in, in terms of trying to make it work better for people. Well, thank you very much. And, yeah, and I think that's actually a good transition. We didn't set this up, but, um, and so I asked my, uh, my CLA if you'd make a copy of this thing. I'm gonna hang it on my wall. And then I said, would you make a copy of picture of Jake? So, uh, and so just did Senator Eaton's going to come up and present um, Senate file 2845. Uh, this is a, dis this part is a discussion. And the summary of all of it is it has to work. It has to work. 
And so there's no discredit to anybody who's working anywhere at DHS about why we're suggesting a change. But we, a lot of people agree it's not working, so how do we make it work better? And so the format of this is going to be very limited discussion uh, by the committee. Um, but we're going to kind of have a presentation, as it were. Senator Eaton's going to start for about five minutes. And then Ms. Freiholtz, London, uh, will offer about a two-minute thought. And then Ms. Hart, Dr. Senator, uh, Senator uh, Commissioner Harpstead is going to do a five-minute thing and share some notes, uh, which is very welcome. And this, uh, Ms. Abderholden will have then two minutes to offer. So I think that's going to set the stage. And then we're going to move into the next topic. And uh, we could spend an entire two days talking about Senate File 2845. And as this goes forward, we may have to. But this is the beginning of the discussion. And so with that tone, uh, Senator Eaton, are you here? And Welcome to our Thank committee. You, Senator Aber. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am very grateful to be included in this bill. It's actually Senator Aber's bill that um, I have the privilege of co-authoring. Um, and I'm really impressed with March as usual um, and all the presenters. This has been, for me, a lifelong issue. Um, Senate file 2845 uh, creates the Department of Behavior Health, and this would move mental health and substance use disorder into its own department with its own commissioner. Um, so there would be a commissioner at the cabinet level to speak out on these issues and um, prioritize them. Um, I'm not going to go over all the data I had because everybody's covered it. So. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, I've worked in mental health for 40 years and um, I am in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. I had lost my daughter to an opioid overdose in 2007 and I send my heartfelt um, uh, best wishes to um, Ms. Lanhart and her son, Jacob. I know how heartbreaking it is, believe me. And what it also breaks my heart is that I know that last year and the year before, we had a, you know, we had a thousand people each year die from opioid overdoses. That's 2,000 more families that have had to go through what Pam and I have had to do. And that's not okay. We're, we're not doing a good job. When my daughter died, she was one of 180 other people who died in the state of Minnesota from opioid overdose. Last year, the numbers look like we're over a thousand. They aren't finalized yet. I mean, all the work we've done, I passed Steve's law in 2014 and um, we did the ORAC committee, um, the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council. I've been on task force, I've been on working groups. Um, we've uh, uh, funded naloxone, um, and it's getting worse. It's not working because we're not doing the part that Dr. Kelly talked about. We're, we're not taking care of people once they've had treatment. The, the answer is not just to get somebody off of drugs. The answer is to teach them how to live without them and to, not, and to have the support so they don't go back to them. And I don't think our department does that. The Department of Human Services is too big. People have been saying that for years since I got here in 2011 and before that. It's, we need to break off a piece and work with people with mental health issues and people with um, substance use disorder and focus on it so, like this wonderful hearing has done. This is, this is exactly what, what I, I'm on this bill for, it, what the March presentation has um, brought us. We, uh, we don't need any more task force. We don't need any more group. We know what we need to do. We just need um, somebody who is focused and at the head of um, a department that is, um, their goal is to help people with substance use disorder and mental illness. It's, there's too many of them who are out there that are homeless or they're incarcerated um, because we haven't kept up the funds that we took out of uh, when we deinstitutionalized everything. Those funds didn't go to helping people out in the community. I don't know where they went, but it wasn't there. 
Um, we have some great services for people with serious and persistent mental illness, but um, that's like 3% of the people who have uh, mental illness. The rest of the people with mental health issues, there really aren't a whole lot of resources for. And, um, and I think a lot of that is, is it just gets uh, pushed under the rug. It's not, it's not the um, sexiest subject in DHS. Uh, we don't get people to um, uh, pound the pavement and pound the tables over this. But I'm so grateful that Senator Abler is doing that today. It's way overdue. Um, Thank you. I don't have, I think that's probably what I was going to say. No, that's perfect. And you're right on time. Um, so you just were trying to pack in so much, but this is, if nothing else, a good kickoff to the topic of substance abuse. And it's like, all these people, you would just hear these terms. So anyway, Ms. Feiholtz, London, do you want to take two minutes uh, and say what you're going to say, and then we'll go to the commissioner. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you, Senator Abler and Senator Eaton. Um, my name is Jody Freiholtz London. I'm the executive director and founder of Wellness in the Woods. We are Minnesota's mental health and substance use peer organization. We have 42 staff and eight board members who are all people in recovery, both substance use and or mental health challenges. And we serve the, the entire state of Minnesota through an overnight warm line that is all staffed by peers and also through a virtual peer support network, which is available all day long to people throughout Minnesota. When I originally heard about this proposal, I was absolutely elated. Number one is that the issues of substance use and the issues of mental health are still surrounded by stigma. We literally need a place at the table so that we don't have to go through these many, many layers of DHS to actually have the voice of people using services heard. We need somebody who can be there, who has the governor's ear, and who is accessible as well by those of us who use services. As we gather information and data from around the state of Minnesota, we absolutely know that this needs to be forefront on the table, and I want to give the full support to the work that you're doing to make this happen. Well, thank you, Ms. Freiholtz, London. And, and Commissioner, I want to welcome you. Um, could I just offer a friendly cautionary note? Uh, you have quite a bit of content here. So uh, we only really do have five minutes. So however you wanted to review through that and use it for reference or whatever. But I'm, I'm very interested in your comments. We had a nice conversation yesterday. We'll have many more. So I want to welcome you to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my slides are coming up. I just want to acknowledge Substance Use Treatment and Recovery Awareness Week by sending blessings out to all the people in Minnesota who are struggling with substance use disorder, their families, and the providers who support them. And I'm eager to talk about the uh, provisions of that March bill. So thank you for presenting that today. So going uh, to the first slide. The background of the Department of Human Services Behavioral Health Division was that it was a merger of three different groups in 2018, three rounds of leadership changes after that with no consistent leadership to build a common employee culture, which led in part to the $29 million tribal MAT and $8 million county IMD over payments that were discovered and made widely public in 2019. Next slide. This is a piece of the, of the puzzle that we are putting in place to uh, resolve those uh, issues. And uh, we are on track to putting together a complete contract system integration project to make sure we don't make these mistakes in the future on top of a Medicaid payment approval process that went into place in January. Next slide. In 21, uh, the Star Tribune asked how far along the agency was in that process, and I said we're in the second inning of a nine-inning baseball game. With the Medicaid approval process in December of 21, Bill George, the co-chair of our advisory panel, said this puts you in the sixth inning of that nine-inning ball game. And investments we're asking for in the 2022 governor's budget when fully implemented are designed to bring us to the bottom of the ninth. Next slide. National experts agree that the path forward for behavioral health services is integrating them with physical health services as the science further explores the mind, body, spirit connections of our health. Minnesota's fostered the development of 55 and counting behavioral health homes to integrate behavioral health and physical health, separating behavioral health from the healthcare administration and DHS could take these advances backward. There's things for you to consider as you consider this bill. Do we need to develop a robust plan moving forward for better results in Minnesota and the components of behavioral health? Absolutely. 
No state has cracked the code on the opioid epidemic or behavioral health in general, and we have not reached mental health parity with physical health in this country, despite Congressman Jim Ramstead's leadership and the subsequent passage of the Paul Wellstone, Peter Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Act of 2008. And so much of Minnesota's response to these areas is still bound in over 600 state and federal granting programs, no two alike, and each requiring 53 steps over 7 to 11 months to go from bills being signed into law to contracts with providers. Their paperwork is real. I would offer that with the opioid settlement dollars pouring into Minnesota's counties, cities, tribal nations, and state right now, that we can be in a summit to level set on state-of-the-art treatments and best practices, lay out a human-centered design roadmap to guide the investment of those varied statewide and local streams to the best return on those investments. I would offer that we work with the Department of Administration and the legislature to simplify the behavioral health contract and grant writing process, not to mention some of the therapeutic paperwork that has kept providers waiting for the generous funding approved in the last session until now as funds are just beginning to flow. I would offer we move forward the proposal in the governor's budget that would increase our PRTF residential facility capacity for kids. It, bill, the bill would expand mobile discharge units and transition to community initiative, fully implement the intention of last year's historic direct access bill, fully implement the intention of last year's historic 1115 compliance bill that moves us toward evidence-based approaches, extending housing supports for people with mental illness to SUD and investing in first episode psychosis and mood disorder programs. Next slide. I would offer that the go forward plan would need to take into account that 70 to 80% of people who benefit from behavioral health services through medical assistance get their care through managed care and contracts overseen by our healthcare administration. And finally, I would offer that we put the whole capacity of the Department of Human Services with its well-established legal compliance, finance policy, county and tribal liaison functions behind these efforts, instead of spending the next two to three years standing up a small new agency that would have to add all of those functions. Next slide. According to Title 19 of the Federal Social Security Act, each state is required to have a single Medicaid agency that makes decisions regarding the use of Medicaid funds. According to Minnesota statute, the Commissioner of Human Services is the state agency as defined by that act. In consultation this week with the Deputy Director of CMS and the CMS Directors of Single State Agency Policy, we learned that other states do indeed have separate agencies for behavioral health who conduct activities via MOU with their state's single Medicaid agency. Next slide. While they may contract to provide other services for the single Medicaid agency, only the single Medicaid agency is responsible to CMS for managing policy, rules, and regulations for coverage, reimbursement, eligibility, payments, and fair hearings for all Medicaid-funded services. As we work to provide technical assistance for this bill, it's unclear to our Medicaid team what this new agency would actually do or what authority it would have to do it. And once again, it's a concern that the proposed structure could be at risk of repeating Medicaid payment errors while relying on interagency communication it was difficult enough uh, several years ago inside the agency. Gertrude Matemba Matassa is our assistant commissioner for the Community Supports Administration, which includes behavioral health. She has a background in nonprofit finance and an MBA and has brought stability and a strong culture to her administration. Jennifer Yang is our new deputy assistant commissioner for community supports and the CSA contract system integration projects that I showed earlier earned Jennifer her Lean Six Sigma black belt over the past year. Next slide. Paul Fleissner, who has a strong reputation in Minnesota as the previous deputy county administrator at Olmsted County, spent the past year with us on an intergovernmental agreement helping to stand up new processes and improve employee culture and behavioral health. We're now in search of the next leader for the Behavioral Health Division and would be glad to include a community behavioral health expert in the search and interview process to select the leader who can move the division forward while addressing the concerns that have been raised as this bill has been introduced. Next slide. In short, we would be happy to spend the next three years moving Minnesota's mental health, substance use disorder, and opioid addiction services to whole new levels instead of working to create a new agency that would have to do the forming, norming, and storming that we've done over the past three years. I appreciate and look forward to the ongoing conversation about this idea. Thank you. Commissioner, good job getting through that. It's a little bit five minutes, but that was a lot of content. So what's wrong with my noise here? Anyway, uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that um, uh, and thoughtful 
comments. Uh, Ms. Abderholden, you have two minutes, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Sue Abderholden, I'm Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. NAMI Minnesota and many other mental health organizations and providers such as Mental Health Minnesota, National Association of Social Workers, Minnesota Chapter, Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid, the Disability Law Center, Minnesota Behavioral Health Network, Minnesota Psychiatric Society, Hennepin Healthcare System, Minnesota Social Service Association, and several others are opposed to this bill to create a separate behavioral health agency for several reasons. Medicaid is a very important funder of mental health and substance use disorder services. In 2007, the legislature actually added many of our community mental health services to Medicaid, moving them from grants in order to expand access. Thus, it's critical that the Mental Health Policy Division be within the same agency as Medicaid. We know how hard it can be within an agency to maintain communication. Frankly, it's even worse between agencies. We have worked hard over the years to integrate mental health and health, recognizing that our head is connected to the rest of our body. Separating out mental health and substance use disorder services from all of Medicaid moves us in the wrong direction. The pandemic has taken its toll on the mental health of children and adults. Combine this increased need with a mental health workforce shortage, and we have a true crisis on our hands. It takes a lot of time, energy, and money to create a new energy. The focus will be on creating the energy, not resolving the crisis. Whenever a solution is, is proposed, it's important to truly define the problem. And what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? We've been told the reason is to shine more light upon these issues and to have better leadership. We have had amazing leaders in the commissioner and assistant commissioner positions under both Democratic and Republican administrations. We've also had good proposals that were presented to governors that in the end, they didn't include them in their budgets. It isn't perfect. We suggest breaking off state operated services. Go back to having an assistant commissioners whose sole duties was surrounding mental health and substance use disorder undo some of the reorganization implemented two years ago. I've been with NAMI Minnesota over 20 years and worked on disability policy issues for nearly 40. It is not just the structure of the agency that creates leadership, it's the people. NAMI Minnesota and the members of the Mental Health Legislative Network aren't sitting around and waiting for DHS to take the lead in building our mental health system. That's our job too. The most gains have been made when everyone has worked together. DHS, the providers, mental health professionals, and the advocates. The department isn't the only place where there is good leadership and ideas. If we really truly thought that this would make a difference in people's lives, we'd be the first to support it. But we don't, and therefore oppose it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ms. Abderholden, and I didn't limit you to two minutes. Um, but I know your voice is important, and I know a lot of people agree with you, and I know a lot of people do not agree with you. Um, and so, um, this is the purpose of this discussion. Uh, and some of us think that this topic rises to a level of needing a cabinet level position. And from my just rational mind, if you person, put a person at a cabinet level, they have to have something to run. Um, so that's the debate. Uh, it's out there, discuss it. Uh, it's not done, this bill will come up again in some format. Uh, but at the end, we uh, just simply uh, <laughs> I'm going to put up this picture again if you want. I just, we're, not, we're not getting done what we want to get done. We are not getting the job done. So uh, with that in mind, the next topic is a bill that is yet to be introduced. I'll be the author of it. Um, there's a draft um, available in your packets. And it pretty much says that when it comes to uh, recovery community organizations, that we need to have a state-focused uh, um, credential uh, because in the eyes of many individuals, many, um, they feel that the other version that we're having is not working. And so that's the purpose of this discussion. We are going to do a hard stop at 244 out of respect for the Transportation Committee. And so with that, we actually have a live testifier. I mean, they've all been alive, but they just haven't been in front of us. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was funny. <laughs> I needed a little laugh today. Um, and I want to point out in your packets, there's a, a good amount of communication from a lot of voices. And yes, this is, a, this is a good discussion for a lot of voices. And I want to point out, I won't burden you with their names, but there's two groups that have taken their name off one letter and put them on a different letter, um, which is great. And a good, robust discussion, I think, only helps solve these very difficult uh, questions. 
Oh, here it is. Anyway, so uh, we have um, four people that are going to comment. Uh, Ms. Anderson is um, going to comment, and she get a little more time than the other three because they're, I think, all in agreement. Although, um, as I read Ms. Jones's letter, it seemed like she was kind of agreeing things are fine. But anyway, um, so Ms. Anderson, maybe three minutes or four minutes or something, and um, and then we'll. Uh, I appreciate you being here, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for allowing me to speak on this important issue. My name is Tracy Anderson, and I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I'm a person who is in long-term recovery from opioid use disorder and the executive director of the Minnesota Prevention and Recovery Alliance. We are a grassroots recovery community organization. We do not provide clinical services or treatment. Instead, we offer a flexible model of free and contracted ongoing peer recovery support services, prevention and recovery focused education, and advocacy for the futures and dreams of Minnesota's youth and other members and other community members at risk of or affected by substance use. We honor and support all pathways to recovery including harm reduction strategies, and work within county systems such as child protective services and criminal justice to remove barriers to recovery. Our sole mission is to mobilize resources within and outside of the recovery community to increase the prevalence and quality of long-term recovery. The current process requiring ARCO membership to be considered a certified RCO in our state is not working. ARCO struggles with inherent conflicts of interest operates in bad faith and does not have the capacity to keep up with the requests for memberships. Over the past 14 months, while our state has had another record year of overdose deaths, I have had over 10 meetings with ARCO. I followed all their advice and all their best practices, and ultimately I was denied a membership. You will hear current RCOs in our state say that we need more RCOs and they want to work together. This is untrue as they blocked MNPRA from becoming an ARCO member due to seeing us as a threat. You will hear them propose the Minnesota Alliance of Recovery Community Organizations, MARCO, as a solution. MARCO is inactive and has the same inherent conflicts of interest and mentality that there's competition in this field, which is concerning as there's absolutely no shortage of individuals for us to help. We need unbiased, strong leaders in this field and processes that we can trust. MNPRA fully supports changing the way the current system works and doing so quickly, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you being here. So we may have time for a little discussion. I just need a little help. Um, there's Mr. Blue and there's Mr. Rutherford. And Mr. Rutherford has some connection to ARCO himself. Does, is that? True, and is Mr. Blue also a kind of a spokesman for ARCO or just for themselves? Um, Mr. Blue, are you like a representative of ARCO or are you representing Sage Prairie Community Services? Uh, I am not an or I am not part, a part of ARCO. I am representing Sage Prairie Community Services. Okay, well, perfect. I'm not going to be not talk. I just uh, wanted to get the thing in order. So let's let Mr. Ruff Mr. Rutherford go, who's connected to ARCO, and then you'll be up next, Mr. Blue. Is that okay? So, Mr. Rutherford, welcome to the committee. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, my name is Philip Rutherford, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Faces and Voices of Recovery. Uh, we're the country's oldest recovery advocacy group, and we started at a summit right there in St. Paul in 2001. Uh, prior to Faces and Voices, I co-managed a recovery community organization in Rochester, Minnesota, and I've been a Rochester resident for more than 20 years. Uh, ARCO, the Association of Recovery Community Organizations, is a division of Faces and Voices, and it was identified in 2017 by the state of Minnesota as a clearinghouse to recognize organizations that meet an established model of recovery support services. Now, in 2017, uh, Minnesota had a total of two RCOs. Today, Minnesota has 17. This growth rate represents the largest increase of RCOs of any state in the United States. Since 2017, we've received a total of 18 applications, and I believe there's a handout in the, that's circulating there. We've received a total of 18 applications. 15 of them were approved. Two were denied based on incompatibility with the national set of best practices. And one, uh, Ms. Anderson's uh, application is still pending. Uh, 
our the approval rating in Minnesota is approximately 83%, which is about 30% higher than the national approval rate of 61%. So as it pertains to the legislation, it's a little concerning to me, both as a recovery advocate and a taxpayer. Uh, on the positive side, I love the idea of the state of Minnesota making a deeper investment in recovery support services. I spent hours and days and weeks pleading for that very thing at my time at the Rochester Recovery Community Organization. I am, however, a little concerned about a lack of stakeholder engagement in the development of legislation. Uh, as you can see in our best practices document, which is also in your handout, authenticity of voice and healthy distance from clinical disciplines are critical components of a well-functioning recovery organization. In addition, kind of back to the taxpayer angle, I'm a little concerned about a new component of governance without clearly defined roles and responsibilities of the members. One last thing I'd like to point out is that since 2017, Faces and Voices has not received one penny of compensation from the state of Minnesota. And we've never asked for that. Our objective wasn't to generate revenue. Our objective was to broaden the presence and availability of recovery support services, not just in Minnesota, but everywhere. Uh, in the case of Minnesota, the data is fairly clear. It looks to me like it's working. Um, we do welcome any opportunity to partner and share our experience in both here and in other states in this type of endeavor, but I'm a Minnesotan first, and I want nothing more than to see people recover from substance use disorder. Anything I or we at Faces and Voices can do to help is at your disposal. Thank you. Well, I, I really appreciate that. So um, thank you for being here, and I'm actually learning quite a bit about this today. Uh, and it, your being here is helpful. Mr. Blue, um, make two or three minutes, please. Terrific. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I am uh, humbled to be here today. Um, so just want to say my name is Marcus Blue. Um, uh, I'm a Native American. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm the owner of a substance use, disorder, substance use disorder treatment center and the founder of a 501c3 aspiring to become a recovery community organization. Um, that said, um, we also, as Tracy Anderson had put it so eloquently, uh, struggled to get into the RCO space due to a breakdown in the current process. Um, the current requirement of this federal accreditation through ARCO um, simply puts an unnecessary step and strain on, the, on quality candidates working their visions and missions on saving lives. Um, we have a long history of experience in helping people in, the, in this nonprofit space uh, as, an, as an RCO would, but we simply don't have that status today. Um, putting this experience into an application, working work with ARCO on what the requirements are. Um, we were turned down for uh, certification due to a lack of working interactive calendar, <clears throat> excuse me, was the response we received from them. Um, you know, it feels to me that this uh, response is unacceptable and feels um, definitely a hindrance to the recovery community in Minnesota. Uh, what I do know is that with the opiate crisis upon us, we need every qualified person who supports the recovery community to be on the front lines. We look to you to remove this ARCO uh, federal certification uh, step in the process and allow the local governing bodies who see the work being done on the ground to certify these recovery community organizations. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I didn't even know which side of the discussion you were on. Uh, Ms. Jones, are you here in person? Um, so, um, and while she's coming, um, this the draft that's there, um, I just wrote it. Um, we talked to a few people behind the scenes. There's been a lot of conversations there, but at the end, it's my responsibility that I wrote a bill. And that is not a consensus document. It is a document, well, it's, there's a bunch of people behind it who have been working behind the scenes. Um, but this can certainly be made better. And the question is, ARCO, uh, ARCO or, or just something else. And so that's the conversation we're promoting today. And Ms. Jones, I, I think I misrepresented your thing. I was confused with a different letter, so I apologize for whatever I said about you. I have no idea what you're going to say either. So welcome to the committee, <laughs> and thank you for being here in person. That's too live. I know. What a treat. Today. It's, <laughs> and it's so good to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Wendy Jones. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I'm the director of Minnesota Recovery Connection, our state's first recovery community organization. The legislation proposed, as submitted for this hearing, raises serious concerns. 
First, it and changed. And actually, just Ms. Jones, you get two minutes all together. Okay, so, great. Yeah, so just to help you yep. get to that. You're doing fine. I just want to make <laughs> I sure. I hope this know. doesn't count against my two minutes. So. <laughs> this, you get a bonus 10 or 15 seconds okay, for this thank little you. interaction. There's no timer uh, going. <laughs> the legislation proposed raises serious concerns. First, it changes the nationally recognized definition of a recovery community organization, or RCO. The RCO model is an evidence-based innovation specifically designed to exist outside of clinical services and to fill gaps across a fractured and siloed system of care in which people affected by substance use disorders are often afterthoughts. Second, it conflates peer recovery support services and the employment of peer recovery specialists with being an RCO. This is a false equivalency. Peer recovery specialists are integral to our work, but the mission of RCOs is broader. As independent organizations led and governed by members of the recovery community, we work to bridge gaps within, across, and between systems. I advise you to review the written testimony submitted by We Covery in Mankato to see how an RCO functions within a community. The proposal also disregards and ultimately erases the significant investment Minnesota has made in building a network of authentic RCOs. From DHS's Recovery Community Organization Initiative in the 2010s to last year's legislative appropriation designated specifically for grants to RCOs, Minnesota has worked deliberately to integrate the RCO model into our continuum of care. Finally, it's concerning this proposal, as you admit, was prepared without full and transparent inclusion of RCOs and without a deep understanding of the significant work to date to build an ecosystem of recovery in which RCOs play a unique role. We have submitted additional written testimony prepared by RCOs representing Rochester, Bemidji, Duluth, St. Cloud, and beyond, and RCOs representing diverse cultural communities. Regardless of how RCOs are credentialed in Minnesota, our paramount concern is the fidelity of the RCO model and its implementation as intended in Minnesota. Thank you. That was actually very helpful. And there's actually one other testifier, and that's the one I was confused about. So you can just stay right there if you like. Okay. Um, and so Ms. Um, Ms. Brink, are you online there? And you can have like a minute and a half or two minutes. You've got your written testimony here. Um, but you've heard the discussion, so if you can kind of just help us understand what your view is, should we, is it working great or should we change it or, you know, sure. that's what I want to know from you. So welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time and I appreciate having any. My name is Brandy Brink and I'm the founder and director of WeCovery, a nonprofit recovery community organization located in Mankato, Minnesota. WeCovery is a grassroots organization that was founded as a result of a need in my community. So Ms. Ms. Brink, yes. please don't read me your letter. Just I am not reading. I am not. Okay, reading well, you're just you've finished paragraph one. So if you know me at all, you know it. Just tell me what you think. Just kind of put the paper down and tell us: Are you happy with our code? Do you think we should change it? Um, yes, your experience and which we take as valued. So okay, thank, thank you. you. As one of uh, Minnesota's first RCOs, the ARCO model did work for me. Um, if at all this conversation is being brought in front of this committee, I would like that ARCO or RCO, Minnesota-based RCOs be brought to the table and included in that conversation. Um, everything else will be included in my letter. Thank you. Well, yeah, but so, and then you, now you said too little. So, <laughs> um, so as you talk to your fellow RCOers, and people who you work with, and I'm sure you have quite a network, do you think that, uh, that, that the system we have now is like, could not be improved upon, or could it be made a little better in your opinion? Sure, I can, I can certainly share that. Um, as a group of accredited RCOs came together most recently as this conversation has been brought up, um, like any system, there's always room for improvement. Um, it is my understanding that any application that goes in front of ARCO, and um, I would like to share with everyone present that I am a newly appointed ARCO review committee. I am one of several individuals across the United States that would now review any applications um, that co come before the ARCO committee. Um, like any system, there's always room for improvement. Um, I believe that most of the concerns that have been raised by anyone that was denied membership 
had a 245G connection. And what I will say is that it is my understanding that ARCO's position is to provide clarity of separation as RCOs really do boots on the ground work within the community where we are able to walk alongside an individual through multiple systems rather than working in one system. I am able to work with an individual at a emergency department um, without insurance and walk through the systems of inpatient services, regardless of any other program they may be included in, I am right. able to provide services alongside that individual. Okay, and so actually, just so you know, what you've, been, uh, what you've entered into is a process, including the RCOs, including the non-RCOs, the RCO wannabes who would do great work with their particular tribe or place. Um, and so um, we'll have just a very short time for just a bit of conversation, but I, this is the beginning of a discussion. Uh, I, for one, do not think it's working. I think our, our goal could be improved, perhaps, to be a little more open to some of their, seems like very pointless uh, reasons they're kicking somebody out. This, uh, the man who spoke, um, lost his name, with the tribes, uh, Mr. Blue, didn't have an interactive calendar. So therefore, people should die because they don't have peer recovery support. Really? That's what my point is about this. All this stuff, all these papers we have are well-intended statements of how we operate. Oh, it doesn't continue with our purposes and our principles. We have to have less of these. And um, so I'm, that's what I'm about. And so I don't want to hear terms like bad faith, uh, that they don't have the capacity to review, threat to their business, conflict of interest, and some minor complaints, having us not serve this person. And I hope to inspire all the listeners today to remember, this is why we're here, not for this. Uh, Senator Fate, and you might get the last word. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but I have more of a question um, than a statement, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, and this might be for Mr. Rutherford or anybody, but um, first I want to thank all of them for coming out today and sp spending a few minutes. Um, it helped me familiarize myself with um, Faces and Voices of Recovery and ARCO, and it seems like uh, the organization is providing important uh, services or providers uh, in the space. Um, but as I'm learning more about um, the system of membership that's done by ARCO, I'm a little bit uh, a little bit confused because it seems to me the membership in this association is functioning uh, essentially as the state's certification process um, for these organizations to provide services. And in most other cases or instances within human services, uh, when we have these sort of requirements, uh, there is a public entity that is run by electeds and their appointees, uh, which is in charge of determining eligibility in this way, whether it's for the licensure board or uh, or a certification board. So I guess my question would be, why is it that in this one instance do we have uh, a private entity functioning uh, almost as a regulatory body? Uh, Mr. Uh, Rutherford, I, I, uh, please, uh, if you can answer that, and you've got about a yes. minute to answer that Abs question. Ab absolutely. And we can discuss more later, but go ahead, please. Absolutely, I can answer that. At the time that this decision was made, there was no willingness uh, or interest to move this into a public realm. Senator there was no, there was no the, the DHS made the decision to, to do it in this way. And um, we were not, we were not uh, offered any real explanation as to why it, it was just, it just happened that way. And I just, there's something I need to add. Please. The, it is, we have very specific records and very specific rationales. It, it is not as haphazard as it is being described when people are when people are uh, denied membership. If, any, if anyone is curious about that, I can submit all the data that, that was associated with a, with a membership decision. There's never a membership decision where someone is denied for something like an interactive calendar. The documents you have in front of you, those 10 best practices, there is always feedback based on those 10 best practices, and there's always specific guidance on what to, what to repair. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. I never thought of anything about bad intent from you. So, no, I, um, I know. So, Senator Fate, we've got like uh, you know a minute left. So, go ahead, Senator Fate. Yeah, just one last quick follow-up. So, I guess my last question would be: Who, who within the public sector is the 
is the organization accountable to? Um, if someone has an issue or complaint, I guess where would they go? Mr. Rutherford. We do have a, oh, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. You're good. We do have a grievance, we do have a grievance process and the typically, like I said, with the 15 applicants, two denials and one still pending, this, this situation does not come up terribly frequently. There is a process for the individuals to uh, to request a reconsideration. Thank you. Thank Senator you. Fonte? Thank you. Okay. No, thanks so much. Well, I want to thank everybody for this discussion. It maybe it came off as hard hitting, and you know, I'm if I was too unkind to anybody, I just <laughs> just can't have this. Um, and I've been here 23 years, privileged to serve. Um, and like Senator Eaton said in the beginning. It's getting worse. And if there's any call to action by all of us here, <laughs> independent of party, independent of where you live or who's paying you, it's not working. We have to find a way to do better. Senator Eaton, I commend you for your leadership on this topic and my, your partnership, Senator Wickland, the whole committee. Um, we are going to make sure everything works better. And Mr. Rutherford, it's pleasant to meet you on Zoom in public. We'll be talking in private. Um, I don't think at the end of the session that we can have things going exactly the way they were. And I want to talk to the RCOs along with the members of my committee, Senator Fate, who spoke up, obviously. Uh, and I'm just gonna, I'm trying to capsulize it for everybody who's watching today who does this work. Nobody intends to live in a world of this. Um, and so we intend to save all we can. And building on that will win. Actually, people will win. So thank you for an excellent hearing today. Really appreciate that. Um, transportation, we're done on time. We're adjourned. Thank you.